You know what you're about to listen to? The Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Here in the spring of 2021, I've had the occasion to travel to Paris a couple of times for work. I'm curating an exhibition at La Maison de Danemark, the Danish cultural center on the Champs-Élysées. It's called Au Vélo Citoyen, La Révolution Roule, Design Danois Urbain, which in English is translated as To Your Bikes, Citizens, The Revolution is Rolling, Danish Urban Design. It'll be a design exhibition focusing on how to design bicycle-friendly cities using tried and tested design principles, as opposed to the chaotic spaghetti infrastructure we see in other bike-friendly countries. It opens on June 18th and runs until September 19th, so check it out if you're in Paris. I know Paris. I used to live there. I visit often. I have a huge urban planning map of the city from 1910 tattooed on my right shoulder. More than many other cities, I have been closely following the journey towards re-establishing the bicycle as transport in the French capital. The catalyst was, of course, the launch of the city's bike share system, Vélib, in 2007. At last count, the modal share for the city is now at 5%, inside the motorway ring, La Préférique. In newspapers around the world last year, in articles about temporary bike lanes, photos from Rue de Rivoli were often featured that iconic east-west corridor. The city of Paris has reallocated huge swaths of asphalt and given it over to cycling. It's a lot of real estate, which is impressive, as opposed to well-thought-out design, which is more necessary. A cohesive network is still lacking. There's a potpourri of infrastructure choices that have a hard time connecting. This is a city with good intentions, but a city that needs to make better design choices. Too many bi-directional lanes, big holes on the cycling map with crazy car-filled intersections to navigate. In April 2021, I was doing my funky thing at an intersection, studying how cycling citizens were reacting to the design of the infrastructure. A young man came up and introduced himself. Turns out he was doing the same damn thing. Romain Lubier is a young urban designer with a company called Cyclable by Design. The word Cyclable meaning bikeable. We spent a few hours visiting different intersections and discussing the design choices, some good, most bad, regarding bicycle infrastructure. Not least the temporary bike lanes the city of Paris quickly put into place to tackle the pandemic. The next day, I interviewed him for a French-language podcast that will be released in association with my exhibition, along with interviewees like the French ambassador to Copenhagen, the head of the city of Copenhagen's bicycle office, and the mobility mayor of Paris, David Belliard. When I came back to Paris in early May 2021, Romain and I connected again, this time sitting in the sun by Canal Saint-Martin in the 10th arrondissement. I had a microphone with me, and on the spur of the moment, I suggested that we hammer out a quick and dirty podcast interview about the state of the urban cycling nation in Paris. We talk about how to tackle the all-dominant traffic engineering culture, the necessity of human observation in traffic planning, Paris's investment in substandard design, who all the new cyclists in Paris are, the new car light streets around Canal Saint-Martin, and how Paris, luckily, didn't build all the highways that were planned in the city center back in the 1960s. It was a spontaneous idea with all the audio challenges that come with it. A bit of wind here and there, people all around us talking in the sun, rolling suitcases on cobblestones passing by, music in the distance, but hey, an auditory soundscape of urban life that I couldn't control and didn't really want to. All right, Roma, I yeah. was in Paris a month ago being a complete bicycle urbanism nerd, standing on the corner of Rivoli and Sebastopol. Um, and then I met this other dorky bicycle urbanist guy, <laughs> you. <laughs> and then were the two dorky guys in Paris that day looking at bicycle traffic. What were you uh, What were you doing that day when I met you on the, the corner of Rivoli and Sebastopol? Well, I was just um, looking at people and people biking on this uh, on this in front on Rivoli uh, on this intersection, especially because 
Um, it's a huge, huge intersection, and uh, there has been uh, some transformation with coronavirus and the new lanes added on on Rivoli. So uh, the intersection is kind of uh, unfinished business right now. Uh, so I was just looking at how people were dealing with the the current infrastructure and how they were uh, managing to find their way through this. As part of study, I'm connecting on this specific intersection. It was fun to watch because the infrastructure is bizarre there. You have, you know, like a football field wide bike lane on Rivoli. You have Sebastopol and like, and there's, it connects very badly. So, I mean, uh, what, was your, what were your impressions of how people were dealing with the infrastructure there? Um, yeah, I think people are, um, are really good at finding solutions by their own, which is something that apparently they can do well because they are on bikes. Because if you look at people driving on this intersection and they realize they can't turn left to Rivoli and then they are like what am I doing so well because they are on bikes people tend to find solutions more easily but still yeah a lot has to be to be done on, on this intersection to make it more fluid and and uh, just more natural for people okay so for context for the listener you might have heard of the temporary bike lanes in Paris, Milan, Berlin. But yeah, here in Paris on this major boulevard, this artery east-west, Rue de Rivoli, uh, they really, they had a big bi-directional that they put in a couple of years ago. Um, and then they just widened it with an extra car lane. So it's this huge ocean of space along this street. We've heard a lot about temporary bike lanes around the world because of the pandemic, but uh, Romain, what do you think about the solutions that have been put into place very quickly in Paris? They reacted fast, but what do you think generally about the uh, the corona the, the corona infrastructure or the corona piste, as they call them in French? Corona piste, uh, they have been um, a booster for bikes in Paris. They have been deployed very quickly by, uh, by the city council and, 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 and people in charge of bikes in Paris. It's meant to be temporary, so no, they have to be they have to think about what next and how, how should we um, transform it into permanent infra. Um, they should look at people, they, they must look at people using it to, to just uh, see how people react to infrastructure. And uh, yeah, Rivoli has to be completely uh, re re refought. Yeah. So you have noticed here living in Paris over the past year during the pandemic an increase in cycling. We've yeah. seen it all over the world. Everybody's saying, yeah, it's like there's more bikes in some places they've been measuring a lot. But I mean, that's your general impression is that cycling, this is a good thing. The pandemic was a good thing for cycling. Yeah, completely. Um, I mean, you've seen uh, many new people on bikes. Uh, many more children on bikes also and not only on weekends but also on, on weekdays like going to school and with their parents because well the infra is not uh, is not um, is still not best practice to to allow your uh, 12 year old uh, child to to go to school alone but still you you see more and more uh, children more and more uh, women on, on on bikes i think it's good metrics to to, to tell a story about uh, the way the, the pandemic has transformed the, the practice in Paris. I mean, women on bikes, you know, the gender split is an important indicator. Um, I noticed it also, I was here a month ago. I'm here now in May 2021. Um, and definitely, you know, they, you can totally see an increase in the number of women. I mean, I did notice it early though. When I first came here, back when Philippe, uh, the bike share system just started, um, I came here with my ex-wife on her 40th birthday and I said, okay, honey, I have to do like a little bit of bike thing, right? Because they have this new bike share system here and I got this blog and stuff and she's got, it's my birthday, okay? You get like one hour for your bike shit and then uh, and then it's all about me for four days. And I'm going, yeah, no problem. But then we're, and, and I said, we, well, you could get one and ride them. She's going, are you crazy? I'm not gonna ride a bike in Paris. We both used to live here in the 90s. Like, no way. Then we're standing down exactly on the Rivoli and back then there were, there were no bike lanes. It was just sharing with the bus lanes. Um, which is not a good idea if you're listening to this from a place that's talking about it, my God. But then she's standing there and it was May and it was springtime and all these you know, women in skirts and heels were riding past and my wife at the time was standing there in skirt and heels and she said, okay, for God's sakes, I'm a Copenhagener. If these girls can ride bikes in Paris, then I can. Let's find one of those damn bike share bikes. And that transformed Paris for us. We had four days where we were just like, you know, going everywhere on bikes and we, we know the city and we're just like, holy shit, it's like the mobility radius is just zoom. So for her, the indicator species was present very early in Paris. Women, younger, older, on bikes. Um, so that was that was her uh, 
you know, catalyst for hopping on one of those damn bike share bikes back then. The talk of temporary bike lanes in many cities are going, yeah, well, the pandemic's about done. We're going to rip them out and put the cars back. What is the, the word from the city of Paris? I've heard that they want to make some of them permanent. What is the general po po politics about these uh, temporary like bike lanes, what are they going to do with them? I think the, the idea is to turn them permanent. Apparently they are uh, starting to uh, make it permanent this summer uh, 2021. They can go backward because uh, there are so much people using it. Uh, even in, in some, uh, some neighborhoods we weren't uh, very bike friendly before and because of the new lanes they are becoming more and more bike friendly. So I'm sure they are going to um, transform uh, this infra into permanent ones. I can't see uh, why with the wooden's. I mean, they have a very green agenda uh, with the mayor uh, Hidalgo and uh, the the mobility mayor uh, David uh, Belliard. I mean, they're talking about it. I mean, yeah. you know, it's kind of it'd be awkward if they didn't do it, right? Yeah, they have this also these uh, 10 minute cities. 20 minutes it is? 15. Oh, 15 minutes yeah. it is. You know what, wait, 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 uh, Romain, I've heard 10 minutes, I've heard 20 minutes, I've heard a one minute city in Sweden, like nobody could figure out their shit, right? Whatever, here she's talking 15. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, bike is a, is a huge part of this, uh, this vision of uh, a city that is, uh, where every function is closed for anyone to, to, to live a, a full life, I don't know, but, so, well, uh, I'm sure it's going to be uh, the, the the next five or six years are, are going to be. Um, I can see why they, they wouldn't go on with the the bike uh, the bike challenge for Paris. Yeah. So France, a big country, proud country. Um, I know that through my work, places like this, like Germany, the UK, the United States, Australia, the big countries like that. They have this all dominating traffic engineering culture and have had it for 70 years. And it's really hard for them to see the beauty of and the necessity of putting in better bike lanes, widened sidewalks, public transport. How do you tackle, you know, in your work in bicycle urbanism and a person who writes and thinks a lot about it, you know, this, this, this dominant traffic engineering mentality that you, are, that you suffer under for so many years? Well, uh... I, I don't have the answer, otherwise I would be uh, uh, like the king of the city, but um, it's definitely the main challenge is to tackle this uh, uh, traffic engineering uh, mentality and the fact that uh, everything about street transformation for now is about technical issues and finding spaces for, uh, for every road users and especially for cars still. The main challenge is to go beyond these uh, technical issues and to um, incorporate the human aspect of because bike is, is deeply human, it's like uh, walking. So we have to, to make a, a U-turn from the technical uh, approach to the human and human experience approach, which is something I'm, I'm deeply involved in because it's my main uh, approach on, on bike infra which is uh, taking into account the human experience and the human uh, way of uh, moving in the street. And You're telling me this and I'm going, so why is that important? I know <laughs> damn well why it's important. Uh, we do the same thing, right? Yeah. But, I mean, but in, in the context of this engineering culture, do you find that the conversations about the anthropology, about the way people are using the streets, the behavior of the cyclists, how they react to the different designs, do you find that they're, that the city or you know other people in the industry are listening to this or, or, do, or do they have their fingers in their ears saying car no. car 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 it's not in the picture right now uh, it's completely overlooked when you, you, you tell people that uh, someone who is biking is not is not at all the same thing as someone who is driving behind his wheel and they, they don't understand why not. and then when you put people on a bike riding in the city they start to realize uh, that it's completely different, that it's much more like walking uh, in the streets. And so maybe that's the, the, um, that's the way, way to go, is to put uh, politicians, to put people in the, um, in the city council uh, on the bikes, to make them experience what it is to bike in a city, and to make them realize that it's not at all like driving, that it's something deeply human. Um, it's, maybe it's part of a reason, of the, the, the solution. Um, now I know that like well the big countries like I mentioned before 
you know, have the same mentality about bikes as in America. The one difference in many parts of Europe is that we realize in our traffic planning that bikes are kind of an extension of pedestrians, where in these big engineering countries, bikes are kind of like a, 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 a a half version of the car, right? So they're, they're put in that category where in certainly in the Netherlands and in Denmark, you know, and in Northern Europe, we put bikes in the category with the pedestrians. So yeah, that's definitely, uh, uh, that needs to change, right? They need to yeah. take the bikes out of the one box and put them in the other. And yeah, I think the politicians at City Hall, you know, the very green politicians, the socialists, uh, you know, they're all pretty bike friendly. I know the mobility mayor, rides a bike to work every day. The mayor, she's seen on a bike. I don't know if she rides every day, whatever. I think all the engineers, I think when you start engineering in the university in France, you gotta you have to ride a bike for the first six months of your fucking education. Oh, you want to be a traffic engineer? Yeah, ride a bike for six months and get back to us. You know. Yeah. But most of the the big traffic engineer schools in in France, I I think they are like uh, the campus are far away from the city. So basically, these these are people who are only uh, thinking in terms of cars and yeah. and big infra like trains maybe planes but yeah yeah I know that like in, in, in North America like in the United States every state has a Department of Transport and they, they do differ actually they have different policies and stuff like so many things in America it's very divided uh, but I know that you have like traffic engineers in Paris who are incredibly arrogant like a grand new idea from Bordeaux They're saying we tried this, you know, for bikes, and it really worked well. Here, they're going, yeah, we don't want to do that. You know, we're we're the we're the traffic engineers from Paris. Like, it, you have a real, you know, class divide between uh, the different regions and the engineers here. I mean, that just makes things more difficult. My God. Yeah. I am now declaring you the Luke Skywalker of bicycle urbanism. The force is strong within you. What would you do if tomorrow you were allowed to do whatever you wanted in Paris, regarding bicycles as transport? Well, I would put people first so I would have a look at what people uh, want how they experience the streets uh, I would watch them uh, I would ask them uh, no, so you're in charge tomorrow so you get to yeah. send other people out to watch them, oh, okay right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah okay I get the point <laughs> and I would start uh, I would start to um, build from that I would say to my uh, engineering team take vacation and then we'll uh, we'll call you back yeah. But um, yeah, I would definitely look at what people, how people uh, experience the street, how they, 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 they ride bikes and build from that. I would also look at Copenhagen, of course. Yeah. One thing we talked about last time I was here was that in places, the city is putting a lot of money into bicycle infrastructure and just general urban redesign. Place de la Bastille, we uh, talked about last time. And Massive amount of money goes into that. It's finished now. Nice public space, but the infrastructure there. You sent me there last time. Yeah. You, you got to go look at this, Michael. If you, you know, we're going to study desire lines and behavior. You know, it's it's like a it's like the porn hub of bad bicycle infrastructure. And I did right. And uh, we talked about it after how there were there was not one single desire line. There was a spaghetti junction of desire lines. As a taxpayer in Paris, isn't that irritating? <laughs> you know that they put a lot of money and effort into this one intersection, a very iconic intersection and place uh, in Paris, and then they did that. I mean, it is a bizarre thing. I mean, are, are you optimistic about the way that they're going when they're already doing huge things like that? On Bastille, there is this uh, the public space, the newly created public space is fine. More trees and, of course, less cars than before. But on the bike. Crossing Bastille is like I need a, an engineering degree, and it's also what most of my friends are telling me when they are experiencing it for the first time. So of course it's irritating. Um, on peak hours, I may need like two minutes to cross Bastille, which is around uh, 100 meters wide or 200 meters yeah, it's wide. Not, it's not far, is it? Yeah. So it's not far, and it's yeah, it's um, it looks like something that is. Like the consultancy firm who was working on it must be very proud to have created something that complicated because it's overly complicated. So you're actually impressed at their overcomplication because they just took yeah. the complication and went to the next level yeah. with it. Yeah. It's like the starting point is well, Basti is very complicated. We should do something about that. So let's make it even more complicated. <laughs> That's well, all yeah. I can think about uh, in Basti. From my point of view, like six years ago, I wouldn't even go uh, across Basti on a bike, apart from my suicidal tendencies. 
but no, I can do that. I can do that. But it's not because I can do that that I should be uh, happy about that. And clearly, uh, it has been over complicated, and, and we, should have, we, we should do something about it. Clearly. Yeah. So there's like stuff that I've been saying for years that I seem to repeat ad nauseum. You know, one of them is I'm not a cyclist. I'm just a guy who uses a bike in a city, right? And the other one is uh, it's not about bikes. It's about what bicycles can do for a city. So we're sitting in a place that's pretty damn cool right now. It's springtime in Paris. There's still a pandemic. People are lining Canela Saint-Martin you know, and the park is filled with people. But what happened around this neighborhood? Because we've been sitting here for about an hour and not one single car has driven past. And I know this street. This used to be just packed with cars. You got to tell me about the transformation of uh, the traffic in this neighborhood. Canal Saint-Martin was uh, one of the main uh, goal of uh, Anne Hidalgo's second term. She said we should pedestrianize it in, during the election in 2020. And then there was the pandemic. They, they, they used the pandemic to transform it uh, much quickly than, than it was scheduled to be. So now uh, Canal Saint-Martin is pedestrianized or at least very car and friendly. Yeah, it's a huge public space right now. You can uh, hang out on the streets and you can do whatever you want. Uh, a year ago, well, it was just packed with cars. So yeah, a, a good transformation of our street, which was uh, uh, very unfriendly into something that is very friendly for uh, public life now. Now, you said it was pedestrianized. It's technically not. The road is still there but they have really controlled the traffic. It's not permitted to drive all the way through. There's a weird, not weird, weird, but awesome <laughs> one-way system. Like in cars are like, we're yeah. directing them, you know, yeah. uh, forcing them to do detours and to go down other streets and things like that. So the road is here, but the road is filled. There's a bike lane. Um, and all we've been doing for an hour is staring at people riding past on bikes. And, but people aren't really taking the space. You know, the, there's, oh, there's two pedestrians over there now walking down the middle of the street people still have that mentality that's a road a car might come because that's fair enough because it's new right so maybe you know they need a physical transformation to really show that no cars will ever be here ever again uh, but it is a fascinating you know observational experience sitting here uh, having our lunch and uh, and watching people yeah slowly and taking it, over it's the road work in progress because like six months ago well it was winter but uh, the September or October uh, 2020 it was already set into a pedestrian as the area and people were less on the streets they were on the pavement and so yeah it's a work in progress and even even if it's the transformation is not physically um, performed yeah you see more and more people uh, taking taking the space uh, again in my urban observations around the world it's it's really quite interesting and fascinating to me how it's a street closure and everybody in the neighborhood knows it's a street closure and the city has broadcast it and there's physical barriers maybe it's a car free sunday or you know whatever open streets movement thing and you watch how people still walk down the sidewalks like the majority only a few will actually go out in the middle of the street because we still have that mentality it's a road this is not my space which of course as we know is completely undemocratic and wrong in so many different ways after seven thousand years of cities so it's a gradual thing I've been counting roughly in my head, you know, oh, there's two pedestrians, oh, there's two more in the middle of the roadway. But most people are walking past us here on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's not a question, it's just sort of, I just think it's yeah, cool. Yeah, and the, the sidewalk is made of uh, old cobblestone, so it's very inconvenient to walk on it. So. Yeah, yeah, but still, oh, I, I can't go out there, not my space, it belongs to those yeah. motors, right? But I think with time, if this remains permanent, then yeah, that, that street will, uh, if we had chairs, we could just like sit out there, that'd be yeah. kind of fun, right? But we don't. <laughs> um, Note to self, bring chairs to Paris next time. All right. Okay, so you, you spend a lot of time studying the behavior of cyclists, how they react to the design of the, you know, kind of half-ass infrastructure here, maybe some good infrastructure there. You know, you're zooming in on all of this stuff in Paris. What about the typology of cyclists? All these new people, as you said, are coming onto bikes uh, since the pandemic started. And generally, cycling is always increasing in Paris from basically nobody just 15 years ago. I think they're at 5% roughly inside the, the motorway, the, the Périphérique. Uh, but what do, you, what do you see when you uh, look at who's riding bikes uh, in Paris? There is a diversity of neighborhoods, the wealthy, the poor, the student, you know, all that, the business neighborhoods. So of course there's gonna be complexities like there is in any city, but tell me about 
what you see? Who's riding bikes in Paris these days? Well, uh, one interesting trend is that uh, more and more people from the, the western neighborhoods, and like in the west of Paris, which are rich neighborhoods, uh, are riding bikes. Uh, of course, e-bikes because e-bikes seems to be the, the cool way of riding when you when you have money. Uh, but you see yeah, more if and you're more rich uh, and white. Basically, anywhere yeah, in the world, you probably got one of those. You, you need an e-bike because you don't have uh, any muscle. Uh, <laughs> you know, <don't> muscle. <laughs> it's years and years of uh, SUV riding. Uh, then, uh, so, so yeah. many people are going to hate that part of this <laughs> podcast, and I don't care at all. Go, continue. Sorry, I'll interrupt it. And uh, yeah, um, uh, what is interesting that is that more and more uh, women from the the Western uh, neighborhood are, are riding bikes. So it's good to see that these people are are coming to bikes. On some neighborhood, like the 10 and the 11 are really small. Not so many things are different from before because uh, people used to. Uh, uh, bike a lot. They were they are very young uh, areas, so yeah, people were uh, already used to bike to go shopping to go see their friends. But what we can see is that more and more young people are doing it. No, the cool thing in Paris is, is not to, I don't know, uh, take a Uber or uh, or uh, go to the subway. It's having a bike and. Uh, having a drink with your friend in in the Canal Saint Martin with your bike, uh, just leaning on on the not literally in the canal though. No, right? no, that's after canal, you drink. Yeah. That's after you drink too much. Right? <laughs> okay. There are lots of bikes inside. Oh, probably that's just that. You know Sorry, I'm gonna, that is a sign of a healthy bike culture yeah. when you find lots of bikes in the canal yeah. because it's just a thing. It's a tool. It's not like a fetish object. So I'm always a big fan. Wow, well, you know, kind of of, of of that. Seeing that. Sorry. Okay. That's the, the main trend in, in, in Paris is uh, that, of course, more and more uh, people are biking and more and more women. Uh, the downside is that still a lot of people wear helmets, which is uh, not a good sign of um, best practice infrastructure. Because uh, if you think you need a helmet to just go around the city at uh, 15 km per hour, then it's, something is wrong. So we were down on uh, Rivoli the last time I was here in the morning rush hour. Sebastopol is the busiest bike lane in the city. Uh, I think you told me 17,000 was the, the highest number per day. Last September, uh, in September 2020. Okay, uh, pandemic year, yeah. but still, it's, uh, it's a good number. Wait, there's a car. Literally, this is the first car in about an hour and a, hour and a half. I think he's uh, moving in. Yeah, he had big boxes on the back yeah. seat, right? Okay. We need a car to do that. Yeah, cargo bikes, man. So for all the people listening to this podcast, we wish you were here. We'd like to drink with you. Maybe not all of you, uh, but a lot of you. What are we looking at? What kind of people are riding bikes past this newly closed street here, right next to the Canal Saint Martin in the 10th arrondissement? In uh, we're a really young and cool neighborhood. I like to hang yeah. out here. This is usually where I hang out. The 3rd, the 10th, the 11th, that's always been my Paris, right? But paint a picture, Romain. You're French and romantic. Paint a picture. Who's riding past? Well, just regular people. I mean, uh, it could be you, could be me. Of course, well, we are biased. Even old people on their uh, Dutch-style uh, bicycle, you see like women with their kids and well, them on the tandem. Two people on tandem. Oh yeah. Uh, it's just like oh. every kind of French people are, are uh, using the bikes here. A lot of vintage bikes, yeah, right. A lot of the young people on uh, an old Peugeot, an old uh, Motobacan, uh, which is cool, right? It's not the big, you know, SUV electric bikes that the rich white people use. It's kind of a real cool mix of uh, bike styles here. Oh, look, a uh, young mother with, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> the kid is yeah, the kid is sleeping uh, literally on the on the back seat. Okay, literally that is an amazing thing because that, you see that in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, the child on the on the seat at the back yeah. just collapsed, couldn't handle anymore, sleeping, the head dangling, and the mother, you know, we got to get this kid home to bed. So that's a, that's a great indicator. Who's coming now? Whole, that was like six different Vilips. Like two kids right now? Yeah, what are they, like seven and nine, yeah. and they're riding their, where's their, are their moms Between. up front? Or maybe that's their dad behind? Uh, I think the mother is uh, in the front. Yeah. yeah. Like riding down the middle of a closed street. Man. And also, yeah, so you, you also see more and more people of color riding bikes in Paris, which is also a good thing because, yeah, you see diversity of people and it's no longer the reckless cyclist uh, who are uh, on the streets on bikes. 
I still find it interesting. The Lib has been a, one of the world's most successful bike share systems. And the diversity of people you see on them, you know, businessmen in a suit, young student uh, in, a, in a dress, uh, people of color. Deli uh, delivery they, guy also? I see a lot or of using, uh, guys, yeah. using the Libs? Yeah. I think it's, it's a huge problem for the Lib uh, that uh, people are uh, using, using the Lib as a, a tool, of, uh, tool uh, for work. You think it's a problem? Yeah, they are constantly uh, changing the, the rules of, um, I mean, the, the, the fare to make it less and less um, interesting to keep a Velib for a day or... Uh, because of the delivery? I don't know, it's only a supposition. Okay, yeah. But, um, but no, now, you, now that you mention it, yeah, there are loads of uh, dudes with their whatever brands you have here. Uh, Uber Eats, uh, that's kind of cool, right? Like in other countries in America, Uber Eats shows up in a car. So that Uber Eats is uh, a lot on bikes here is, uh, is a pretty cool thing. But still, that if it messes up the whole point of the bike share system, uh, yeah. the quick A to B, last mile logistics, that's not very good, is it? You know, you got two young guys there. You got Two Peugeot. Oh yeah. Two, two yeah. young ladies with uh, old Peugeot. There's a whole porn website I should could make with French vintage bikes. Jesus. Oh yeah. Young. Trendy, fashionable dude on a on a on a cool old bike. Okay, so simply because I find it interesting how so many cities wanted to buy into the American dream and just flatten entire neighborhoods to put in motorways back in the '60s. Copenhagen, Oslo, Helsinki, Amsterdam. Well, you were telling me about this place where we're sitting right next to Canal Saint Martin. Uh, can you tell me about like the canal and what was that park? It's just covered with people right now, drinking yeah. wine in the spring sunshine. That park and the canal, what were the plans in the, uh, the Corbusier uh, No, it past? was not the Corbusier, it was uh, the Plan Autoroutier for Paris, uh, the, the highway plan for Paris. In the I, I just blame Corbusier for yeah. all these things. Sorry, but no. it's, it's like derivated from uh, the Corbusier way yeah. of uh, thinking. And the idea was to create a, a huge uh, network of highways inside Paris, inside the, 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 the peripheric area. And so the, the Jardin Villemain, uh, where we are now uh, standing, was supposed to be one of the main hub and interchange area for this uh, uh, network. So highway were supposed to come from underneath to go to uh, Bastille on the Canal Saint-Martin. So Canal Saint-Martin was supposed to be um, I don't know. Just, uh, removed. just removed, yes. Oh, yeah. Then it was uh, the, the 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 plan was uh, buried, and I know it's one of the coolest places in Paris to hang out yeah. uh, in a sunny afternoon. So, thanks thanks to uh, Pompidou to have uh, created this uh, Tauke plan. plan and but he died suddenly, didn't he, Pompidou? <laughs> yeah. That's also kind of a good thing for the <laughs> like. I'm sorry to say it, right? But I. It's, uh, I'm sure he had a family and everything, and they were sad to see him go. But really, his, if he had stayed in power, he could have really just hammered through so many yeah. more of these uh, American-style infrastructures. Yeah, it was probably the, the, the biggest lobbyist for cars. The, the funny thing is that the, 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 the big plan for uh, the, the highway in Paris was killed by Chirac, who was a, a big uh, advocate for cars in Paris. Uh, he said, Paris uh, veut rouler, on va l'aider. Paris wants to drive, we will help them. <laughs> but he killed it because, uh, yeah, well, the, the oil crisis was already behind and uh, it was no longer the... Um, I mean, Parisian, they wanted something different from just cars, I think, already in the, in the 80s. Uh, I've written an article about it, about how crises, disasters, are just awesome for bikes. Right? Of course. I mean, we don't want these things happening in our lives. Well, the oil crisis, we were kind of like, that was maybe a good thing, a yeah. good catalyst for where we are today. But, you know, after Hiroshima, you know, people just grabbed a bike because, you know, they had to survive and the bicycle was a tool. Uh, we've seen it all over the world. Every time there's a, a metro strike here in France, which is like every second weekend, right? But, <laughs> or, but in London as well, transit strikes, the pandemic, right? It's just a never-ending boost, the financial crisis as well back in 2008-9 and all that. So it is really a, an amazing observation to see how the bicycle, whenever we we forget about it and all of a sudden we need it, the bike's right there going, yeah, all right, where do you want to go? It's a, well, I'm really going poetic on us here now. We're not even that, 
I'm not even drinking, Jesus. But then there is the urban poetry of the old motorway along the River Seine, which was called the Georges Pompidou yeah. motorway, and now it's just a bunch of people hanging out, listening to music, and uh, drinking some wine today, right? That's, yeah, I love that uh, urban poetry. Yeah, and even the, the, the part of the Pompidou Way, which is uh, still open to traffic, has been uh, cut in half, and one part of the, 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 the way is dedicated to bikes. So. so what was the Chirac quote again? Paris veut rouler, on va l'aider. But the quote that I literally have quoted the most over the past several years in keynotes and in interviews is a quote from another mayor of Paris, Bertrand Delanoy, the, the guy who was there before Hidalgo and she's continuing his work and doing her own cool thing. But his quote, man, the fact is that there is no place for cars in the big cities of our time. That one is like the mayor of a major global city saying that kind of stuff. That is cause for us to all stop and think, whoa, maybe we are going back to the future, right? Yeah. yeah. You got, you're got good at quotes, you French people, right? You got a lot of cool quotes, good and bad, but still very <laughs> quotable, right? <laughs> awesome. Dude, this was maybe more unstructured podcast episode, yeah. but we're sitting here in the sun. It's May in Paris. The pandemic is slowly winding down, and uh, the future is on bikes. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for your time, Roma. Thank you. That wraps up another episode of the Coolville Urbanism Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Koval Anderson. Thanks for listening. And you know, remember, it's your city. Take it back. <laughs> <laughs>